Welcome back to my YouTube channel, everybody. Our guest today is Ms. Julie Sirs, who was a, is, is a former DIA agent who has been to Afghanistan a few times during the first Taliban regime in the 90s. And I must admit that Julie and I already know each other because we made another interview a few years ago about the same topic, pretty much, the first Taliban regime. And um, my readers and my viewers can find the link to this previous interview to the, in the description to this video. So, Julie, thanks for your time and thanks for joining us. Would you like also to introduce yourself and say something more precise or more complete about yourself? Well, I, I think you got it pretty well. Thank you for having uh, me back or to interview me again. Um, I was with the Defense Intelligence Agency before. I was an intelligence officer, mainly an analyst, but I also traveled uh, to the Middle East region, particularly Afghanistan, a number of times, as you mentioned in the late 1990s and, and the year 2000 when the Taliban were in control of much of Afghanistan. Um, I did that partly through my job at DIA and then also later um, when I worked in the private sector as a consultant. Okay, let's start from the first Taliban regime. You've been there twice, you told me. Uh, what were the harshest aspects of the regime that you remember? Well, I, the, the time I traveled most in Taliban areas was actually my first trip to Afghanistan in 1997. I traveled um, from Pakistan to Kabul um, and, and the area around Kabul as well. Um, and the Taliban, that was fairly early in their rule. They had taken over Kabul in 1996, but even at that time, it was very clear that they were going to have a very brutal regime. Um, there was also already a, a fair amount of corruption that was obvious from the Taliban side. It's often said that, that they ended a, you know, more casual corruption by some of the former factions that had ruled in that area or, you know, were somewhat loosely affiliated in other areas of Afghanistan. But, but actually the Taliban engaged in much the same thing and simply in a more organized way. They would also stop, for example, that the bus that I was on from Pakistan, they got on, they demanded money, they you know, forced people to move around the bus, they separated the men from the women. They were already showing very much their authoritarian streak in a way that, that even other Afghan factions did not. They were much more extreme. Uh, they also had a, a sort of secret police force already engaged with the people that I was staying with in Afghanistan. We had to leave early because the Taliban had learned that, that a Westerner was staying with them. Uh, when we left Kabul, I saw people that the, the Taliban had, had hung, um, allegedly for, for being spies for the resistance against the Taliban. Um, and the, there was already some evidence of you know, a lot of money going to the Taliban, some areas where in Kabul where they would be associated with, with Arabs or other non-Afghans. And so again, this was fairly early on in their, in their regime, but it, it was clear some of the connections and their practices uh, that caused a lot of condemnation later were already present then as well. But my first inevitable question about this second regime is, was is this the only ending possible to the war in Afghanistan, or were there other possible conclusions? I think there were other possible conclusions, but really the the seeds for what happened recently were, were laid very long ago. If we had taken a, a dramatically different approach to Afghanistan, hadn't put our own forces there, hadn't determined who we wanted in the government, but allowed the Afghans to have more of a role in informing both their own military and their own government, then I think you would have, we would have created uh, a, a more viable Afghan government that could have withstood the Taliban. But because we wanted a military in the image that we wanted it to be in, we wanted a, a government where there were former Afghan exiles who spoke English well and with whom we were very comfortable because we wanted those people in charge. I, I think in many ways what, what happened most recently was, was somewhat inevitable. But let me ask you your opinion on something very, very specific. Who made the worst mistakes? The former administration by signing the peace deal with the Taliban and cutting off the Afghan government 
for the incumbent one by uh, withdrawing from Afghanistan so fast? So I think between those two administrations, definitely it was the former Trump administration who, like you said, created that deal with the Taliban, did not include the Afghan government in it, really undercutting them, as you mentioned, releasing thousands of Taliban prisoners, uh, encouraging or requiring Pakistan to release Mullah Baradar. Um, all of that was, was with the Trump administration and part of the problem that we saw with so many Afghans needing to get out so quickly was that the Trump administration had also pretty much brought the program to a halt where Afghans who had been our allies could emigrate to the United States. There were many of those Afghans whose applications had been denied or, or had not been processed so that there was a huge backlog of those individuals. If many of them had been able to get out during the former administration, there wouldn't have been as many people who needed to get out so quickly and who still do now. But ultimately, like I was saying, I, I think while those are some of the more immediate causes of what happened most recently, Fundamentally, I think our mistakes in Afghanistan go back very early, even to the Bush administration. And what will the conditions of living in Afghanistan be from now on for the Afghans? Well, hopefully we can continue to help get them out. There are certainly many thousands who still need to leave, who, who, have, who are under threat. Um, and it's my understanding that the State Department is continuing to work with some of them. Hopefully, if they're able to get out to other countries, um, they can be safe in, in the meantime while their applications are processed. I know the Biden administration is trying to expand the categories of Afghans that, that can uh, come to the U.S. Or, or hopefully other countries will work with us and they could go to other countries as well. But there certainly are many Afghans who, for safety reasons, need to leave the country and, and hopefully those efforts will, will continue. They do seem to be continuing to some extent already. Well, the world now is especially concerned about the condition of women under the Taliban. What do you think it will be like for women in Afghanistan? I think it will be very difficult. Um, you know, certainly the Taliban showed in, in the 1990s uh, what their attitudes are toward women and basically blocked them from all public life, causing a lot of suffering not only for the women themselves, but their, their families or for school children. Um, I think it in some ways will be harder now potentially for the Taliban if they want any sort of outside recognition or assistance. I think the, the condition of women will be an important uh, pressure point that the international community will hopefully put on them. There are potentially some who have a, a very slightly less negative view towards women's role in Afghan society, which has expanded quite a bit, especially in, in more urban areas over the last 20 years. So I think it will may perhaps be harder for them to undo that, um, even if they want to. It, it looks like women are very bravely in Afghanistan trying internally to put pressure on them as well. So I think fundamentally the Taliban do not have a changed view of women at all. I think they're, they're still very um, authoritarian and draconian toward them, but I think it may be harder for them to implement now in some ways. Okay, you already said something about it, but I would like to ask you a, a question about something very precise. The Taliban are now presenting themselves as being more modern or being maybe more moderate. And there's also uh, a kind of controversy about it because some politicians seem to be believing that and some others are not. And uh, what do you think? What do you expect? Are they reliable in this case? Is this make-believe? What do you think? Yeah, I think for the most part they're not reliable. I, I think they're maybe a little smarter now to realize they need to say that sort of thing. I don't think they truly believe it. There, there might be an individual or two within the Taliban that, that maybe have a, a slightly less regressive attitude. But I think for the most part, as a movement, what, what fuels them is their extremism. And I think that extends toward women. So again, it is a potential pressure point the international community can uh, put on them and maybe even to some extent pretend to believe, but, but, but I don't think it's, it's genuine on the Taliban. No, me neither. 
<laughs> One important difference that I see at the moment is that in the 90s, actually, they were allies with Al-Qaeda, uh, allowing them to run and to build bases in Afghanistan. At the moment, uh, they are actually enemies with ISIS Khorasan, and they are even at war with them. So this seems to be a striking difference because probably we will not have the planning of another 9-11 style attack because they are not allied with the biggest terrorist groups uh, in Afghanistan. What do you think? Yeah, that's a difficult issue because I, I think there's a lot of ideological overlap between those groups um, in, in terms of their larger world view. So it is possible while they are against each other right now, it, it's entirely foreseeable as different groups in Afghanistan have done over decades, if not centuries, that, that they could ally again. So it's definitely something keeping an eye on. Uh, the Taliban themselves may allow other groups, perhaps groups that would be less likely to, to conduct a 9-11 style attack, but others that could <clears throat> contribute to instability in, in other neighboring countries in particular, whether it's Pakistan, Iran, or or some of those Central Asian countries immediately to Afghanistan's north that, that could still cause some problems. So I, I think there is still potentially a, a terrorist threat from Afghanistan, but I, I think you're right that the current situation between uh, Taliban and, and the Islamic State would complicate that in, in the near term, at least. Well, and very linked to my previous uh, question, isn't it a bit unfair to say that the U.S. lost this war? Because when this war started right after 9-11, the goal was to destroy Al-Qaeda bases, not to put a good government in Afghanistan. So even if I'm very saddened by what's going on, I don't think it's fair to say that the U.S. lost this war. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's correct. I, I think when people frame it that way, that's part of the reason that, that the U.S. stayed in so long in, in a way that wasn't really helpful. I think U.S. policy, by and large, failed because I think we did hope that at some point to, to have a, a viable, stable government in Afghanistan that could defend itself, and clearly we didn't do that. Uh, but it, I don't think we really lost the war in terms of, of what our military aims were at, at the time, we just didn't politically le leave a government that could fend for itself when inevitably we would need to leave. I don't think anyone thought we should stay there indefinitely. So yeah, I think it's more of a political failure than a, than a military one. Otherwise, there's no uh, military win unless you completely invade the other country and annect it to, to your country. So. I agree with your view. Many thanks for your time, Julie, and uh, thanks for watching, and see you next time. Thank you, Leonardo.